voracious, intense, and hungry, the dermestid beetles are very effective at what they do. But don't worry, they're no threat to you unless you find yourself in a bat cave. I definitely don't want to fall when I'm in the cave now. <laughs> if I fell in here and, uh, you know, like broke my leg or something, what would, uh, what would happen? And I don't know. <laughs> I don't really want to find out. <laughs> The back beach is back well away from the water line. Different kind of critters live back here, and one of the most important ones shows us evidence of his little house right here with this mound of sand and a little hole. And we're gonna dig down there and see if we can uncover this little ghost crab that lives in this little burrow. He sits down there in nice air-conditioned comfort all day long, waiting for the next night. And there we go. Here he is. Look who lives down in the borough, a ghost crab. One of the neatest little critters on the back beach. Neat little exoskeleton colored just like the sand. Look at those beautiful little periscope eyes pop up and down. Got neat little pockets there to put the eyes down when he goes in the burrow. They're basically a scavenger. They feed on most anything live or dead they can run across but they're also little predators. They know how to get clams and little fish and things in the surf. And we're ready now to turn him loose and let him go back home. The world's oceans are the last frontier on this earth, and I love being underwater, and I've always dove ever since I was little. So every time I go, it's just a thrill each and every time. I love doing research underwater because it's such a complex and fascinating environment. The basis of my research is to take photographs of the coral and to compare that to photographs I took at the Flower Gardens, which is the coral reef right off the coast of Texas, and try to see what's similar and what's different about the two sites. The practice or art of calling wild game is the uh, simple activity of going out and reproducing a sound that uh, occurs naturally in the outdoors anyway. He's right in the middle of the night. It's incredible. Many nocturnal animals don't see the color red very well at night. So Gerald uses this to his advantage. Then, if they stay around, he gradually removes the color. During the nesting season, the male screech owl retrieves and brings a bug back to the mother and the fledglings on the average of every 30 seconds. Do you imagine the amount of work he's got to do in a night? They live on uh, moths and lizards and June bugs and all kinds of little things. Well, he's sticking around a long time. There's no magic, just the good use of a few sounds and a lot of time recording them. I looked up in this tree, and uh, there was a bear in the tree. So I'll go in and tell my wife. She didn't believe me, of course. She had to come out and look. Good shot. Well, he'll go down in a minute. He's in a perfect tree, because he'll just hit those branches, and it'll break his fall all the way down. We're going to attempt to drop him down. <laughs> That's a big bear. Oh. OK, I need tip of his nose right on the tip, right down the middle center of his back. We need more tape. <laughs> We put the tracking collars on these bear because we want to determine their home ranges and compare it to other studies in the United States. Uh, I expect us to find some pretty exciting information out. And uh, without the tracking collars, we wouldn't know as much about what was going on, especially about individual animals. Collars plenty loose. He's snoring. He'll wake up, he'll be really groggy. and. He's not really a problem bear. Uh, he didn't do any damage or tear anything up. 
we really moved him for his protection, not for people's protection.